Hello and welcome to Elven Home and to this week's edition uh, that's all about starting to lay the track and uh, plan out how the bottom section of Elven Home is going to look with a blooper right at the end. Well after the last video which was very much one of destruction it's time to move on to construction. Uh, and just to show you what I've been doing since the last video. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just talk about the work that's been done so far, a little bit about the things that are sitting in front of me, um, then go off and do something else, and then come back for the last part of the video uh, to talk about what's emerging in my mind about how the layout, what I'm going to put in, in what gaps. So uh, I think I'm trying to remember, but in the last video, I'd got to the point where I was starting to stick down um, new cork around, if I move slightly to the left here, the new line of the track is, is slightly further in deliberately uh, than the previous line of the track, because the, uh, the previous line went out and made a sharp turn and ran very close to the boards which I hadn't realised until I started filming and saw just how close the train got to uh, banging into the end board there. So the track has been deliberately moved in a bit. Uh, you'll see that the main pieces of track are all laid out in the places they're going to be. I think they may be the right lengths. Um, it's possible some of them may need to change because this is all flexi track. Uh, this is all code 55, so that's all there is. And that gives you some interesting um, challenges when you're laying the track. Uh, I'm not going to try and do a, a tutorial on this at all. Uh, Pico TV, their channel, has uh, in their help section, and I'll put a link to the playlist in which you will find this. There's loads of videos, but there are five videos between five to ten minutes long which all deal with laying FlexiTrack. And as they're the manufacturer of FlexiTrack, they'll give you much better guidance than I will. But for those of you that have engaged with it, or well, who've never engaged with it at all, uh, if you're in Code 55, there is nothing else but FlexiTrack. Uh, there's no set track. There's the, and all the uh, turnouts and slips and the kind are, are specifically made for Code 55. Uh, and if you want to join them together, you have to cut bits, lengths of track. I use a Xeron cutter, uh, like many I think do, um, because although I know some people use uh, a Dremel with a disc on it, equally there are people who tell you don't use that because you'll melt the, uh, the webbing. Um, but I find the Xeron cutter absolutely fine. Uh, this is my one with a tiny wee hole. There you are, can you see? That's where I made the mistake of trying to cut a pin off a Pico um, point motor. Uh, don't do that. Um, the Xeron cutter is no match for the strength of the pins on Pico point motors. Um, but one side of the cutter is absolutely flat, if you have a look at that. That you have parallel to the track you're cutting, and you cut straight down. And it does a fantastic job of making a, right, uh, a nice neat cut. If you cut the wrong way around, you get a mangled piece of, of uh, um, rail. So don't do that either. Um, so I use that to cut the, cut the ends, uh, and then usually have to file that a little bit just to take any burr off there to be able to get the fish plates on or, or um, rail connectors on. After this section, I'm going to put a, a video up which shows you a little trick that I picked up from Charlie Bishop on Chadwick Model Railway, which I know he'd picked up from other people, um, on how to put fish plates onto track, particularly if that track is, is sitting down on the layout. All of the curves that I've put on here, I mean, you'll see in front of you a complete set of track setters, if I, which are also, I don't know if Pico actually make them, they certainly sell them. And when I started doing my layout, I thought, I know, I must have a complete set of track setters. And so that is what I bought. Uh, of those track setters that you can see there, which are invaluable tools, the only one that I ever have ever used uh, is this one, uh, the uh, straight one. 
um, because having bought the track setters, I've always uh, built all of these uh, curves on uh, with a radius that is not one of the, <laughs> the radius radiuses or radii uh, for which the track setters come. They start down at uh, 9 inches, then it's 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 30 and 36 inches. For those of you that are used to using um, set track, 9 inches I think is radius 1. 12 inches is, I think, bigger than radius 2, maybe even bigger than radius 3. Uh, and 15 inches is bigger than radius 4 if I've got my uh, conversions correct from the uh, set track uh, geometry uh, plan that you'll get in the in the Pico catalog. Um, so these are not a direct comparison to what you would get if you were using uh, set track uh, and they are useful if you stick your plans to these uh, radii um, and they are really helpful at being able to begin to bend the track. I found um, that I was able to bend the Code 55 track by hand because I had my plan and I could um, gently uh, ease the track in. You must be careful because you don't want to get a kink in the track. Um, in case any of you are, worry, are wondering why a 500 gram weight is sat on the viaduct, apart from testing its capacity to take great weight, uh, relatively speaking, um, it is because the inner track on the viaduct uh, is the actual piece of track bent to the right curve and is fixed uh, down and pinned in place where it joins the main line. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why I've done that in the next bit of the video. That is the first piece of the new track to be properly put in place. Uh, not least to help me position where the uh, viaduct is, but also for other purposes, which I'll come on to in the second part. Uh, the piece that sits underneath it, if I come round to here, is not attached to it. That's just lying roughly in its position, bent to shape. That is one of the previous pieces of track. And in fact, I haven't yet had to cut any new track. I think the existing track that was there can just be reformed and reshaped. Interestingly, it looks as if this whole curve will be slightly shorter than the curve it uh, replaces, even though they're on slightly wider radius. I think it, the whole thing does look to me to flow better uh, than it did before. And as I uh, complete each part, I will cut away the paper uh, plan that sits underneath um, because I will be, as I'm putting this down, I'm going to be pinning this good and hard uh, and gluing it at the same time. Because this is sitting on cork, which is sitting on uh, foam, track pins will work for a while, but they're not necessarily going to work forever. Uh, so. Uh, I'll be able to use some bigger pins. When, when I come to do that, I'll, I'll record it. Some bigger pins that you can get from... Well, actually, you can get them from Woodland Scenics. Um, but I've discovered that these pins are also used by people who do knitting to um, stake out knitting when you are doing a thing called blocking. And these pins are exactly the same. I don't know if they're cheaper by buying them through them, but they are exactly the same pins really big pins, deep pins that will go right into the foam here and hold the track good and hard while it's drying. And then I can remove them uh, afterwards um, and the glue then will hold it. So I think that will be much better than what was there before. Uh, and before we get to, before I get to that point, I will want to put all the track into place and run some trains around it just to make sure it all works. Because once it's glued down, it's not impossible to get it up with PVA, um, but you don't really want to be playing around with that more than, than you need. So that's, uh, that's all in place. The bridge over there, which is the one that took the chisel, if I zoom in, if you'll let me zoom in. There we go. Uh, 
that bridge was the very first thing I ever built. Uh, but as you'll see, where there was once brickwork uh, and a crest, there is now nothing. Um, and the leg that you can see facing you uh, took a direct hit. I managed to straighten it out a bit, but it's really rather weak. So it is going to have to go, I'm afraid. It's not capable of being saved. And in any event, uh, as you will discover in the next uh, portion a bit later on, I'm going to change that, that whole area. I have resolved in my mind that that is going to see quite significant change down there. So that's all uh, for now uh, on here. We'll come back to this at the end of the video. What I'm going to do now is just nip off so we do something a bit different and show you this clever trick for getting uh, rail connectors onto track. In the previous section, I mentioned a little uh, tip for uh, getting rail connectors. Um, there's these little bundles of joy uh, onto the end of track. As I said in the previous section, uh, this is not my idea. I picked this up from Charlie Bishop on Chadwick Model Railway. And I'm pretty sure when he introduced this, he'd said that he, it was a tip he'd been given from somebody else. And I know uh, from responses on uh, Ian's Shelvington uh, YouTube channel, where he had been talking about engaging with the joy of putting uh, rail connectors onto Code 80 track, uh, that a number of you out there have uh, used this method as well. And it involves this piece of, now this is Code 55 track, uh, I only use Code 55. When I first started uh, doing the layout, I spent a lot of time reading which track should I go with. Uh, it's called Code 55 because of the height of the track above the um, sleepers. And if I show you an end section, if I can get it into focus, you will, I think, see that the track is set down into the sleepers. Um, that gives you an added joy. This stuff comes in one yard lengths or three foot lengths um, and you cut it to the length that you want it to be. Uh, and on the back you will see that it has the webbing cut in places and that's what helps make it bend. It is quite flexible. It will bend the, op the opposite way to the cuts but, for, but uh, it much prefers uh, to go that way, let me cast this is quite a small piece, but as you can see, you can bend it really quite easily. Uh, you can bend it more easily if it's a longer piece. Um, just while I'm, I'm, I've got this here, I mentioned the way of cutting with the Xeron cutters. This has been cut with the Xeron cutter using the flat face. Again, let's get this into focus, and you'll see how straight that is. The other end is a bit mangled, but that's because, of course, the Xeron cutters were being used to cut a clean edge from the other side. But that's the difference of using the Xeron cutters the right way round as against the wrong way round. And the beauty of this is that it makes it much less in the way of cleaning up. You will probably have to clean off a bit of burr from the bottom there. One of the other things that I find sometimes, again, if I can get this to come into focus, there is, you'll probably see that there's a channel here into which the fish, fish plate or the rail connector fits. And occasionally at the very end there, you can get a small burr. Uh, so if you've got a something uh, that you can run along that burr, the blade of a, a scalpel will do it, just to flatten any piece of metal that's been bent up by the process of cutting. Uh, because if there's a little piece of metal in there, uh, you will have the devil's own job getting the uh, rail connector to go on. But the little tip, really, it's a, a brilliant idea. I don't know who came across it the first time, um, except I've lost my rail joiner. There we go. Now, uh, these are very fiddly things, but they can be made a bit less fiddly by using this method. I'm trying to work around a camera, which is making this an interesting exercise. But essentially what you do, first of all, is you fit the rail joiner onto this piece of track. Now that 
it makes it a lot e more a lot easier to manipulate this thing because part of the problem is trying to move if the track is not yet set down a piece of track and one of these tiddly little devils and what you can then do is bring the two together he said and then slip it on and there you see it's gone on then you can just hold it there and remove the piece of track and lo and behold you have the thing the uh, brow connector on there equally you can do this when the track if you've got a piece of track that's already set down on the board uh, a lot will depend on how easily you can get to it because if you're working over a great distance it could still be pretty tricky but the beauty of this is that if that's laying down on the track it can be easier to bring these two together this way sliding that on and then holding this probably with a pair of pliers and removing so this is just a piece of track taken from a, an off cut that had got too short and bent through that's roughly 45 degrees it may not be quite 45 degrees just to give you uh, some working space it's a very clever little way of doing it I only learned I picked this up from Charlie after I've been doing the about half the laying uh, and it was a godsend it made life so much simpler getting uh, the fish plates onto the track particularly if you've only recently cut them um, but you know you will have to do quite a bit of dressing of the end just to make sure everything's flat and particularly that that channel is empty uh, because if it isn't you won't get these little levels on there so there we are a quick tip for you uh, now back to the plans for the revised area I promised you earlier that I would uh, talk through what my emerging thoughts are uh, and they are very much emerging thoughts uh, so emerging that I'm in danger of thinking about them as I'm talking to you uh, but anyway let's tell you where, where I've got to so far uh, the far distance which we already talked about the bridge I mentioned that that is that has got to go and it is likely that that area will change markedly what's in my mind at the moment is that the whole of this area here will be filled in and will be a, a the, there'll be a rock face starting from here uh, which will go along and come across the track so there'll be the tunnel portals um, and this will have been cut through the rock to provide a, a the base for the for the railway and underneath there is going to be a uh, tunnel for um, a canal barge and I had with me a little while ago which I have now lost uh, the portal that I've cut as a template and if you think I can find it I can't never mind I'll show it to you in the next uh, the next video I've been using the barges that I've bought as uh, to give me a, a size to help me with the size of the um, portal that I need to cut and obviously uh, the only bit you'll see is the bit of the portal that's above the water line um, but I think I'm likely to move to raise all the ground for the base of the canal which will run through here and then make a right turn more of that in a moment before passing through the lock here which raises it up a step and then it will disappear off again uh, through a, a tunnel here uh, so the rock face it will curve around as high elven uh, the revised high elven the bit where I chopped it all off it will curve around here um, and come to the front of the layout and and terminate and that will help that's how the canal gets on and gets off um, the uh, you'll see that I've moved the position of the of the lock lots of people thought that it didn't look quite right where it was I did indeed find places where the railway had come along after a canal had been built and just simply built straight over the top of it including over an existing lock uh, the railway obviously making a point in the 1830s and 1840s about the demise of the canals um, but nonetheless I, I, I indicated I think in the last video that my mind was thinking that actually that needed to move 
uh, and I think it is much better there. I also like having the the level of the canal lower. Now, as I said, I may raise it up about half an inch, which is which will be where the bottom of the the canal will be. Uh, I'm not going to put tons of uh, water in, but I will obviously sink the barges uh, a little bit. Possibly, I would think looking at that. Uh, maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe not as much as that, into the uh, canal water so that it does look as though it's some of it is sitting below the water. Um, and then uh, the, it'll lift up and, and take it off. So similarly, this will only need a, a fairly small amount of uh, water in there because it'll be as if a canal barge is just about to enter before the, the lock is filled up. Um, the area to the right here is where the gasworks is going to be. And uh, that is going to mean that the whole of this will be lifted up to, to this level and probably extending a bit further before I cut the canal through. Uh, the canal as it passes through Edinburgh uh, was cut behind, uh, the housing was was uh, put up there or may even have been there before some of the canal was built I think um, and it has plainly been cut through with a quite high wall and then on top of that is the is where the housing uh, exists so I think that's not uh, that's not uncommon one thing uh, that did worry me though with these plans would be the sharpness of the turn as the as the canal comes out of here to go towards the lock um, so I spent a bit of time on Google uh, and if I put up here, uh, actually not Google, on the National uh, Library of Scotland website. Now it may be that some of you have already found this website because I was able to go as part of a course I was doing with Edinburgh University, a short course, to visit the National Library of Scotland and to hear from one of the men that curated uh, the work of geo-referencing maps of the United Kingdom. And what it allows you to do is to go back and look at old maps and to reference those against the modern day satellite image. Um, it, you will, you'll lose hours and hours doing this because if you want to go and look at old railways that no longer exist, uh, that's a perfect way to go about uh, doing it. But what you will see on your screen now is a picture uh, of Edinburgh in uh, about 1893. This is a, the, an 1896 copy uh, edition of the 1893 map. You'll see something that doesn't exist now, which is the end of the Union Canal uh, as it got to the uh, Edinburgh and came into two basins, Port Hopton and Port Hamilton. Uh, and as you'll see, there is a very sharp right-hand turn there. Now I walk this most days because I walk along the canal, um, uh, along the bottom of the canal, and at present the canal ends um, where you'll probably see on there it says Iron Foundry, just below a public house. Uh, and what you can do with this map is you can take the opacity of the map right down and lo and behold, the modern day uh, image is, sits below it. Uh, and in a minute I will zoom in uh, to where the uh, canal now ends and you'll see that it ends really in the bottom centre of the map. That's where the canal basin, where the pointer is pointing at now. Um, oops, there we go. And when you zoom in, uh, you'll see there the green uh, boat. That's where you can go and stay if you wish. Uh, that's the end of the canal. And the remainder of the canal has now been all built over. It was closed in the 1930s uh, and built over in about the same time. And if I bring it back up, that's... Uh, there's the, the, the original map. Now, as I said, you can spend hours and hours on this map. It is a quite remarkable thing. 
Uh, and in fact, um, just above the bit that you can see here is the old Caledonian railway line into Prince's Street, which no longer exists. But there we are. So, um, I, so that allowed me to know for, for certain that I, that I can, making sure the lock is wide enough, give room for a barge to make the turn coming out of there. I'll probably build this as starting the turn under the bridge so it's not coming out and then making the turn, but the turn has already started. Uh, but I do at least have uh, a prototype to use for so sharp a turn coming out of the ridge. I've yet to make up my mind finally what is going to be on the ground level uh, around about here. There's a, an old 1940s service station garage, which I have a kit that I had my eye on for a while. And that may need to find a way in because one of the things I'm going to have to solve is where the road comes in that brings traffic into uh, Weathertop. Because as you know, at the other end, down near Grey Havens, the, the, there's no road. The road ends there. Uh, and the road must come in through a tunnel somewhere. Um, and I thought, well, then maybe I can uh, that in a way this solves a problem for me. Having taken out the road that was going to dive under the old viaduct, uh, I've got to put it back in somewhere. So I think that's what I'm likely to do. I think um, I could bring it under one of these portals of the viaduct and run it alongside the canal, uh, possibly. Um, but I rather like the idea of running it straight and actually having this area here below High Elven as fairly just just scenic area with very little built on it. Uh, although it's possible, I suppose, I suppose the Golden Perch might go there nicely as a roadside pub. But as you can see, now I'm doing the dangerous thing of thinking and talking to at the same time. Heaven knows where that's going to all end up. So that's where we are at the moment. Be interested in any uh, comments you have um, on those emerging plans. They are emerging plans. They may change. They may not. We shall see. Uh, but that's where I've got to so far. And that brings us to the end of uh, Elven Home for this episode. Um, as we really are beginning, well, I am, I don't know who the we is, I am beginning to um, get clear in my mind how I'm going to make the changes and can start the work of, uh, of putting bits and pieces in. As I said, if you've got any comments, do let me have them. Always welcome those. Uh, if you've liked the video and you can give it a thumbs up, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. And if you haven't already subscribed, well, please do subscribe because it'd be great to have you along. But until I speak to you again in a fortnight's time, here uh, is a section of a video from earlier on when I made a very schoolboy error, uh, which I found funny and I hope you will too. But until I speak to you again in a fortnight's time, it's bye bye from me. Bye bye. Uh, of those track setters that you can see there, which are invaluable tools, the only one that I have ever used and you'll guess it, is that one, to get a straight piece of track. Did you see the um, deliberate error that I made there? By putting a magnet onto the... <laughs> right. Mm -hmm.